All right, let's continue the series on what it means to be a trend following moron. We're now on part four. There's only one way when you boil it all down. And I do a lot of that in more recent years, like boil it all down. Let's reduce this down. Let's simplify it. What are we trying to accomplish? We're trying to make money, okay? Well, the only way to make money is for a greater fool to come along and buy the stock higher from you than where you bought it, okay? And you need to wrap your head around that and only think about that before you put on your next trade. And of course, you wanna make sure, a few things I kind of glossed over a second ago, that the trend is really strong, it's persistent, it's accelerating, the stock is clean, clean or trades cleanly, it doesn't look like electrocardiogram, and of course, acceleration and all those other good things but and of course you also make sure that pullback is deep enough to have knock some players out and attract some shorts or something like the tko like i said last week the only way to ever profit from a trade is to sell higher than you buy it and the person who buys it from you is the greater fool so if you boil it all down again we're greater fool hunters okay that's our whole mission in this trading life forget about the fibonacci and the counting of the waves and the situation in nigeria <laughs> cross between arnold and who's that andrew kissinger so there's there's only two questions you need to ask or need to be answered i should say before placing a trade is there a greater fool and Remember that sometimes you are the greater fool. So am I the greater fool? And yeah, believe me, many times I am the greater fool. Now, a couple of more important questions. <laughs> I threw this in last minute. Is before you put on any trade, why would someone be selling me this stock? I have a brother-in-law named Andy. And he tends to, we call it Andy. He tends to Andy you a lot. He'll He'll ask your opinion on something, and when you go to tell him, he'll tell you how wrong you are, and he'll tell you what his opinion is. <laughs> so, anyway, his father must have a maybe Andy gets it honestly, but um, my mother-in-law has asked me periodically, you know, tell me when you think gold's looking good, I'll buy some. I was like, all right. So a while back, not now, like now, but like now, but like now, the gold was hitting some brand new highs. It was looking pretty good. So they came over from dinner, for dinner, and I'm like, now's a good time to buy gold. Where should I buy it? And I, said, and I gave them a few websites and, and such or whatever. And I'd helped them buy it before. So it was, was it a big deal or whatever? And then he started to berate me. My father was like, why would they be selling it to you? I'm like, because they make a profit. You sold a profitable business many, many years ago. You should understand how inventory and profit margins and all of that stuff goes. And you know, I was thinking to myself, and uh, but he kept, he kept kind of bad for me. Like, why would they be selling it to you? It's like, okay, well, why would they be selling it to you? If 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 you listen to all these commercials on the radio, and that's probably what he's talking talking about, is all this fear mongering. They tell you on about how much higher gold's going to go. It's like, well, why would they be selling it to you? Well, they obviously don't believe what they say, or they're stupid, <laughs> you know, or they need a more convincing argument. And the other question you need to ask yourself is why would someone pay me more in the future than it's worth now? So will those greater fools, so to speak, come along? Um, I think I did day trades. I think after it was all said and done, I don't think I made much money, if any, in the, uh, what was that, GameStop thing? But it was a fun ride. I mean, it was up I'd be up 8,000 and down 7,000 and up 2,000 and down 3,000 and uh, even on a small share size. But my thinking on these days when it was going crazy was these people are so stupid to buy it at these higher levels. I'm going to buy it and sell it to them. And uh, that was a bit of a fiasco, but but that's another story altogether. And I think overall it, it, it wasn't it wasn't worth the mental anguish. But you need to ask yourself, why would someone pay me more in the future than it's worth now? And, and you don't want to confuse the issue with facts. Whatever the current bid of a stock is, that's its current 
value if you look at a sell it. And the price of the stock is the ask if you're looking to buy it. You can't justify or whatever. Yes, you might have some setup where you think that if this setup triggers, it could suck some people in uh, because the, they just got knocked out and they're trying to knock out or the shorts just got sucked in and maybe that'll cause some buying. But the bottom line is you have to accept what is, is, and then always think in terms of the greater fool. Now, there's a lot of harsh realities that the TFM must accept and embrace when it comes to trend trading. And this is kind of a, kind of dovetails in or, or completely overlays for that matter presentations that I've done here and there about trend following, about you're going to be wrong a lot. And even when you're right and go back a few episodes of, of Week of Charts, you'll see that even on a really good trade, you spend a lot of time under endless wealthy, so to speak. So that's one of the hard realities of the being a trend following moron or just being a trend follower if you don't want to be a trend following moron. I like being a trend following moron because whenever I try to outsmart the market or do something stupid, like trading not to lose, and that's something that I wanted to get into tonight, but we'll have to pick it up some other day, maybe next week. Trading not to lose is like, oh, okay, I can go in and just risk 100 bucks. Who cares? You know, if I lose, I just sweep it out of the rug. And you're probably going to lose more than 100, and you're probably almost guaranteed to lose at least that 100 and probably more, I'm trying to say it. So you got to be really careful not to go in and say, oh, I, I don't have a lot of risk here, so I'm going to take a trade. You only want to trade when the odds are really stacked in your favor. But anyway, I said I was going to get into that next week. I just pretty much explained the whole thing to you. But I'll draw some charts up for you. But you uh, you must be present to win in trading. And I've told the story many times, and it's more than one individual. So I, I think it's one person that thinks I'm picking on them. <laughs> But I've told it to more than one individual. But I remember one email that I received from, from somebody, and it says, "I don't, I don't see anything setting up in the foreseeable future. So I'm, I'm going to stick with you, Dave. I'm going to stay with the service, but I'm going to go off and have a vacation. I'm going to have some fun, and I'm not going to even think about the markets." And I'm like, "Okay." And then the next day, we found two setups, and I'm trying to figure out what they were, but there were two setups. I keep wanting, to, I keep thinking one was CNX that that really took off literally the next day and you know unfortunately you probably was thinking wtf and that's just kind of the perverse nature of the markets it's like right when you give up is when the market takes off it's like the market will grind you down and make you give up and then right about the time you give up is when it takes off and as i've said before it's weird because it's one of these paradoxes, and that's something else I've been working on forever, is paradoxes of trading. One of the paradoxes is that, again, as soon as you, as soon as you stop doing your analysis, as soon as, let's say you're, you're following a, a system, and as soon as you give up on that system, the system begins to work again. And then a lot of times people will end up perpetually out of phase. And so that's the paradox is like, is that you 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 feel like Einstein's definition of insanity doing the same thing over and over again expecting a different outcome and the paradox is sometimes you have to do that provided you have a viable system and it it it's more like Churchill Churchill's definition of success is moving from failure to failure without any loss of enthusiasm so you have to work those two out and it is a bit of a paradox Anyway, I remember, I think it was this trade. It it, uh, it could have been another one, but I'm pretty sure it was this one. And I remember coming in every day, every day, placing orders, placing orders, placing orders, placing orders, placing orders. And then one day, I just was thinking, especially since I had closed poorly the day before, and I was just thinking, you know what? I'm not going to bother placing an order. This thing will probably never trigger. And a market is kind of per perverse like that, and it'll wear you down. And fortunately, one of you guys in Facebook, and, and I don't remember who it was, but you pointed out that the stock had triggered from the trading service. And I'm like, oh, crap. And it was only a, a few cents higher than where I had intended to get in. So luckily, I was able to get in. It did not take off without me. 
So that's the that's again, you have to be prudent and you have to be patient and you have to be present. Oh, I need to write that down. Prudent, patient, and present. Easy for me to say. <laughs> now, when the market slides, the overall market, and this is a little bit more related to the overall trend following in the overall market, market timing. But when the market slides, it comes right back in. You're going to look like an idiot. And by the way, if you don't have the occasional bear markets, then market timing does not work. So you you need bad markets for market timing to work. The market needs a 50% haircut every now and then. And it will have a 50% haircut every now and then. That's one of the things I can guarantee. And one of the things I wanted to mention earlier, somebody on Twitter pointed out, and I back tested it, and it, it's it's fairly high, not quite as high as they thought it was initially, because they must have been looking at a smaller subset of data. But once a market drops 10% and triggers that TFM 10% sell signal with the 50 simple moving average, there's a 60% chance. And I think, again, it's it's more like 58 or 57 and a half. Don't quote me on that. But there's a, there's a roughly 60% round number chance that that market will drop another 10%. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And that's that's a, a very good, uh, what's the word for it? Very good reason, I guess, for lack of a better word, to follow a market timing system or use some sort of market timing system. Now, what's interesting is friends and family never ask me about the market when it's doing well. They always wait until, like I said, after the bomb blows up, they always wait until the market's down 30% and they're freaking out. And they ask me what to do. I'm like, well, the bomb's already blown up. You know, we had a sell signal six months ago, you know, and it puts me in a, in a, in a interesting position. But it's like anytime I try to be a little proactive with them, when the market gets hit really hard and I say, look, I'm, I'm getting some sell signals here, guys, you might want to pay attention. It's like all of a sudden they defend their guy to me. So it's kind of damned if I do and damned if I don't. I just keep my mouth shut. I let them, you know, just wait until it goes down 30 percent. They ask me what the hell to do. But they always defend things like my guy has made me 60 percent in the last five years. And then when you have like a V-shaped recovery like this. People are like. Oh, man, I'm glad I held on. I wish I'd have bought more. Well, in hindsight, yeah, but I know some of these people and not one in particular, but I, I know I know one in particular and I'm not sure what he did. That's what I'm saying. It's like I'm not sure how he played out, but I know one in particular because he stayed with me and this was doing that pandemic slide and he wasn't sleeping at night and he wasn't he wasn't too keen on, on much at that time because he was he was watching his profits evaporate and he was hoping to retire he's just retired recently he was hoping to retire within the next couple of years so the v-shaped recoveries will make you look like an idiot if you are prudent so that's another thing you have to accept as a trend falling moron and my friend who was bragging about his guy made him 60 percent without looking at the market and without even knowing my immediate comeback was the market made you 60 percent. i don't think your guy made you 60 percent and it was interesting after that statement, I looked everything up, I think it was earlier this year, and I was shocked to see the market was up 107%. I didn't realize it was up 107%. <laughs> so his buy and hold guy made him 60% and, and my buddy's happy, but he could have done a little bit better, uh, maybe just indexing. But that's a story for another day. The point is when the market comes back and if you don't have serious sell-offs, then buy and hold actually works and it'll make you look stupid for trying to time the market. But again, just to beat the dead horse a little bit more, when you're out of the market right here and you watch that market drop another 20 or 30%, that's a great place to be. Unless we get him ready to take off, I'm about ready to call it quits. <laughs> Hang in there, John. You know, that's the thing too. You know, you're one, you're always one trade away. And, and it, it it comes back to the definition of insanity and then Einstein, uh, what is it, Churchill's definition of success, you know? But yeah, it's like right when you think you're about, you know, whole, it's, it's like um, as traders, we go through this trader's journey over and over again. You know, it's a hero's journey, trader's journey, kind of the same thing. And it's like we have these all is lost moments fairly often, more often than we probably should, right? 
and then one trade, bam, you knock it out the park and you're back, you know, which is a more to more. We're back, more to more, <laughs> more to more, we're back. Buy and hold often wins, or buy and hope often wins. Enough for the asset gatherers. Oops, I'm sorry. I mean, financial advisors. I use that term loosely because his guy could have just indexed and done a little bit better than 60%. He could have done almost twice as well. But anyway, these guys can have a fairly long career. And I actually got the word asset gatherer from one or two ex-brokers who came to me to learn technical analysis. And they, they got into the business, like I think everyone, like, oh, what, am, what are you going to do? Well, I'll become a broker and that'll make me a trader. And it's like they soon find out that it's not really like that. It's just like you're following the 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 formula for the Kool-Aid or whatever. But buying hope can work for a long time and make people look really, really smart and make a trend probably moron look like just a moron. 